Ladies and gentlemen, a man who needs no introduction. If you're in Nigeria, if you're in Lagosian, please welcome with me a man of many parts, Dr. Moise Banira, senior advocate of Nigeria. Thank you. Dr. B, my person. Look, let's get it. Why, why are you so humble? My wife said so. When you just drove in, in, in a Camry, now you drove in in a Camry. Why, why, why do you always pretend like you don't have money or you don't have anything? Be driving Toyota Corolla up and down. He, he drives a Toyota Corolla by himself. Not the new one, the battered 2000. And why? Uh, because that's all I can afford. Uh, no, no. <laughs> There is recession. Um, <laughs> we see what your mates do. People who are not even up to you are blowing siren. And they are smarter. They are smarter. <laughs> let me tell you what is weird. There was, there was, let me be opening small, small family secrets. There was one time during one election about four or five years ago, thereabout, where the report came that uh, there might be a threat. So the police commissioner insisted that he had to have uh, security. You remember? He has a Range Rover Sport that he never he used to have, that he never drives. So they gave him the security. He put the security in the Range Rover Sport to be following him up and down while he was driving the battered Camry. <laughs> is it that the person who did the medicine for you said that the war of the medicine is that you must never ride luxury cars? No, you, you, no, you can ambush me with one force. <laughs> okay, I should, I should, I should. Just buy one and see whether I will write it. Just like. Dr. B, just, if you don't want, just give me. I will, I will take. I will take. You're yeah, welcome. You, you. Are, you have to be in so many places today. Thank you for being here. It's amazing. Uh, he was here first in 2010. Then you were commissioner for uh, environment of Lagos State then. And, you know, as we have uh, worked together over the years, uh, it occurred to me during your 50th birthday ceremony last year. I was MC at his 50th birthday ceremony. It occurred to me as I was emceeing the event. That way too, it is either Dr. B is lying about his age, or you have been successful for a long time as a young man. If you were 50 in 2017, that means that at the time you became a commissioner in 1999, you were 33 or thereabout. That means that you became a commissioner in Lagos State when you were five years younger than I am presently. Is that what you're saying? Much lesser than that. <laughs> Much lesser than that. Look, I left your birthday depressed because I calculated it. You were, 30, you were, you were younger than that when you became a commissioner. You were a commissioner for 12 years. So please ex explain to me, how, how did that happen for you? The grace of God. The grace of say more than that just can't be given one one line answer. No, it's grace of God now. <laughs> well, beyond, fundamentally, I will attribute it or ascribe it to the grace of God. But beyond that, quite naturally, my expectation is that when you are focused and you know what you are doing and you demonstrate the competence and the capacity, quite naturally, people are likely to embrace you easily and assign you assignment. For example, just yesterday we were at a forum where we were debating this age of contest. That is the age that you can contest for something. And somebody said, the, you know, currently for you to contest as president in Nigeria, you need to be 40 years old. And I said, why should we put it at 40? Rather than put it, would you just say anybody from 18 should be able to contest? Then cap it and say, be, not beyond 65 years. That once you are 65, you can contest. I said, that's the way it should be. And that is where I see it, because in contemporary period, it's not so much about age. It's about the exposure, the exposure of some of these children have these days are even much more than the one that we have, and their competence. So, so it's focused, essentially. You know, I believe you, because uh, it is easy for anybody to think you are like most of, well, a lot of people who are in politics now who just have a godfather. But before then, you were already a professor or a lecturer of law at the University of Lagos. 
in your early, late 20s, early 30s. So that means that you're already on this trajectory. Again, same question. How does one go on to become a lecturer of law? In their 20s in uni, like, I, like so for what? And, and law, I mean, are, you, are you using something? How do you go to become a, a teacher of law, a lecturer of law in uni, like, when you were in your 20s? No, you know, uh, the an average age of graduation during our own time, uh, if you have not been so much disappointed by Jambo Wayek, yes. it's around 20 plus that you will graduate. Now, of course, by the time you finish, our you know, own profession is even longer in the sense that you have to go to the Nigerian law school to actually, uh, to actually become a legal practitioner. So, and thereafter, of course, in my own situation, immediately I finished my, my law school and my LYC, I immediately returned to the University of Lagos um, to do my master's. And immediately I finished the master's uh, because of my own level of distinction. I was immediately absorbed into the faculty of law as a lecturer. Uh, then and of course, from that 1999 till I left uh, in, I mean, 1991, I left Union Lag for public service in 1999. I left as a senior lecturer in law at the Faculty of Law. Of the senior University. lecturer in law at how old? First, look, see, I, Dr. B, I went. You know, you know, I'm, I'm a graduate of Union Lag. And so that's bizarre, me behind law. I know what senior lecturers look like. Yes. Senior lecturers look like you now at 50. <laughs> that's what they look like. So how could how can you be telling me that you were a senior lecturer and you were, what, 32? I mean, you, you must have even been small amongst all the other lecturers. <laughs> you know, we are getting younger ones now that are achieving higher feet than that. Because like I said to you now, you see, our own world then was even largely analog. These children of nowadays are largely digital. So they even move, they move geometrically while we move arithmetically. So well, if you are looking at I'm sure you find people of 20, you probably find people of 27 okay. as senior lecturer now. Okay. There's one question I've always wanted to ask you. Yes. Close as I am to you, I've never asked this. I, 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 I know your life, but I don't know the bridge between Unilag and Ashiwaju and becoming a commissioner. I mean, you weren't just sitting in your office in Unilag and then they came to call you. I mean, what, what happened? What was that bridge? Especially as we were coming from the military era into that. How did you get into that place? Again, I will go back to the, my earlier remark that to say, because beyond all things, you must always place credit at the first uh, doorstep of God. Of God, of God. You must clap for God. That's where you must start from. Now. Because no matter the level of dexterity or the energy, or the capacity or competence that you have. If that is lacking, you can't get anywhere. That's the reality. Now, I tell you for free, for somebody like me, I've always believed that if possible, all of us must be actively engaged in politics in the sense that you can't continue to be a perpetual complainant. Things are bad. Forests are going up and all those stuff. And you are not participating. It's either you put yourself forward or you get actively involved in choosing those who will lead you. And so, right from my old school days, I've always been in unionism at all levels. And uh, so, immediately I left, of course, I joined them also within the political circle, uh, contributing my own quota. And um, uh, quite unknown to a lot of people, as uh, far back as around 1987, even when I was in Unilag, we have started associating with some of the political associations outside, externally. And uh, I remember that uh, there used to be a, part, a political association called PUF, and then, of course, I was part of it then. I was even assistant legal advisor at the world level then. And by 1990, when we had the Social Democratic Party, uh, the platform under which MKO, late MKO, contested, and of course, uh, Achuaju contested also as a senator, I was legal advisor of the local, two local governments simultaneously. Uh, Muchi local government, <laughs> Muchi local government, and Ojo. Ojo had no active lawyer within the party then, so somehow along the line, I had to also be their legal advisor. So I was serving the two of them simultaneously. And of course, from that moment on, going forward, I've been used to most of them. And of course, again, one thing with uh, that particular regime is that uh, there was more focus on people that are nowadays referred to as technocrats, people that are from 
largely outside the political circle. But in my own case, of course, I combined the two. I was in the academics, and of course, I was in their midst equally. So it wasn't that difficult. And the practice then was even that uh, largely you find recommendation from the various local government to whoever must have emerged as the governor uh, towards the constitution of the cabinet. So that was the process that I equally went through and eventually became one of the people nominated by him. For the commissioner, you must have been, were you the youngest on the... Yes, I was throughout. You were My, the youngest commissioner. Throughout the time I was exactly. there. <laughs> <laughs> amazing, amazing. We'll take a short break and we'll be right back. Don't go anywhere yet. For more, because the Tedu Baby Face Show will be back after these messages. Thank you very much. We're right back on the Tedu Baby Face Show, and I still have Dr. Muiz Banire in the house. I have uh, two more questions for you, sir, because you have to go and do all these many things that you're going. And I've told you, don't go to that Ijebu place today. <laughs> Can you believe he has two parties in Lagos today, two in Ijebu? He's still here, and he has a conference. Wow. So, I have to, wow, Gani. <laughs> Driving Camry up and down. When they should be blowing you with siren. Anyway, your, your theme for wanting, wanting to impact Nigeria, you've left, the, you've left uh, public service now, but you're still doing it. You called me one day and said that, uh, you, you don't attend our meeting, our meeting of UAC. I said, ah, uh, uh, UACK, the makers of Gala. You said, no, uh, United Action for Change. Uh, that's the name, right? In that you don't attend our meeting. And so I came to the place, and apparently you are the convener of a meeting, a, a, a think tank of progressives, people who want Nigeria to be better. You meet every week somewhere on your own dime. It is free. All of you come and contribute ideas, and then not only ideas, you take actions, immediate actions to make things better. You are like the Office of Public Legal Services in the manner of speaking, USC. What, why are you doing this? Well, let me say first and foremost that um, UAC, that is the United Action for Change, is not a political movement at all. It's like a, it's a pressure group. It's a movement on its own that is geared towards enhancing the society. And it consists mainly of people who believe that they need no office for them to be able to add value to the society. Those are the people that you likely find there. Like we normally say, we don't share rights there, we don't share money there. If I rather people contribute to make things happen. And um, what we do there, like I said, is to add value to the society, bring up the younger one by, for example, conducting. Uh, leadership training programs for them, of course, empowering them by training them in also vocational training, and of course, also doing public interest litigation, like where we feel that people are unduly deprived. We take it up on ourselves to challenge the institution. And from time to time, in fact, as a matter of practice, uh, monthly we do old roundtable conference where we brainstorm on issues affecting the society. For example, I know in the past we've had on good governance, we've had on energy, we've had on solid minerals, and a lot of lot of issues like that from time to time where people contribute ideas and we escalate it to the next level for them to be able to act upon it. And of course, I take pride in even saying that the group was the first to even convene the first town hall meeting in the entire country where we felt that our leaders must be accountable for people. We assembled the people, largely people that are agitated, to say, okay, let's bring your leader. Then we brought the vice president to say, okay, raise all your issues. Tell him how you feel. Let him respond because he owes it. So that's the kind of gathering that we have there. And of course, we believe that from time to time, in fact, there is a particular aspect of it we are dealing with in recent time across the state. It's called legislative advocacy. We put together uh, bees in areas that we feel that people need to know. For example, we are not too satisfied with this whistleblower 
policy that yes. has just come up. Yes. We have already put forward since a year ago, over a year ago, we've drafted a bill that we have taken to several houses of assembly in Nigeria that they should enact a law in each of the state that will enable people to be able to access information and to be protected where to divulge information. <laughs> well, well, quite expectedly, it has not seen the light of the day. We were not shocked because we do not expect them to naturally hang themselves. So that is still hanging all over the place. So that's part of what we do. For example, even the Freedom of Information Act that we have today, you find that except for about three states in the whole of Nigeria, others have refused to domesticate that law. So it is impossible for you, for example, now if somebody says, I've tied your road now, to ask the man to say, okay, you tied my road, fine. How much did you tie it? The man will not tell you. It's possible that the amount that has been so, called, uh, so expended on that road could have done 10 of it. But, you know, in our own psyche here, the natural thing you find is that you start dancing and thanking them for using your money to do your service. <laughs> it's always unfortunate. <laughs> you know, our psyche has been so much bastardized. Okay. So if anybody wants to join you at uh, in USC, yes. uh, how can they do that? Uh, well, we have a website. You okay. can just access the website. That's the easiest route. Just go to uacng.org. you find all the information about the movement there. UACNG. Thank God you said yes. it yourself. Because when you said you had a website, I was thinking of asking you. But somebody was asked one time ago about a yes. website, and that didn't particularly end well. Mm. So I'm happy that you know your own website. Yes, I was a bit uncomfortable too. But unfortunately, no guard is <laughs> <laughs> Dr. B, with all due respect, <laughs> with all due respect, you're, you're not well, sir. <laughs> God, okay, 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 last, last question. I have so much to ask you, but time again has gone. There's never enough time on the show. One thing that fascinates me the most about you is this. I asked you when you came in 2010, while you were yet a commissioner, I said, do you still practice law? And your answer was that, you said it in Yoruba, I'll translate, ah, of course, our chambers are still open. Ah, Tori Boti, Lejoni. When you have a case, you will know I still practice it. And I thought you were just joking. And you left service almost willingly 12 years later. As far as I know, you are the longest serving commissioner in Lagos till date. 12 years. And I think you left when you were tired. And you have gone back to law. You're practicing law left, right, and center. I'm speaking to you a few days ago. You've gone to your chambers in Abuja. You're doing this. You're doing that. It is unusual around here for somebody to be in office and leave being a commissioner after 12 years. You don't want to run for Senate or State House or Governor. You don't want to go to Abuja. You have gone back to private practice. Two questions out of that. First of all, is that how much law is paying you? Second to that, why? Why are you different? Is, I mean, why are you not there? You see, part of the problem that we have in Nigeria today is that we all collectively, all of us are guilty of it, uh, is that we tend to put people in put people without alternative contract addresses in position of leadership. <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> it means, what that means is that people without any job, they haven't done anything successfully in their life before. They have no other shop anywhere. You put the man there, what do you expect to be the output? That's number one. Secondly, is that the man will die, do anything possible or not to continue to be in that system forever. Because he has nowhere else to go. <laughs> That's the first aspect of it. That is why, personally, I always encourage people to say, look, you must ask questions. Look at the pedigree of the people that are coming forward. Don't look at the platform alone. These days, platforms are deceitful. In fact, there's hardly any dissimilarity between them these days. So you must be able to probe into the individual that has come forward. That was your pedigree, what's your competence, and what do you have. But that's number one. Number two, again, is the fact that beyond that, you discover that if truly you want, if you want to live the kind of life you have set for yourself, you must have something else to do. Because how much are they paid? Go and ask, and don't take any minister 
Yes, up to a million naira now. No, I have How would it suffer? I had it on good authority that is about 960,000. Aha. On good authority. Less than 1 million naira. Yes. And if you look at the liabilities and the expectations from people around him alone, his immediate family, there's no way he can cope other than to compromise or to steal. So, the alternative for him, if we are going there, is to be sure that there is another source of survival. That's one. Secondly, that will not also bring it to the level of desperation that I must remain in that system. Because once you finish there, you see like any other service. That, okay, I finished, let me go. It's just like in the universities. If you are a dean today, say you are a dean of law, or the vice chancellor of a university, the day you finish your tenure, you go back as a lecturer, it's as simple as that. But it's only years that I must keep on going up. When I finish counselor, I must be chairman. From chairman, I must become honorable. Honorable must go to rep. Rep must become senator like that. That's the way they see it. In fact, they do not see it. In fact, people are still here to see the need to be able to even add value to society without office or platform. I must have an office. If I, somebody recently came to me and said, okay, look, I want you to introduce me to a certain governor. So I said, ah, that's not a problem. I can introduce it. If it is, I finish doing the introduction, the next day he said, which appointment will you give me? That's an appointment. <laughs> <laughs> me, I don't know about that one. But whereas on your own, as an individual, you have so much that you can add to this. So much. But quite in this area, I mean, this uh, contemporary period where we have, uh, what do you call that your thing? Which thing? Uh, weapon of mass destruction. Uh, destruction. Uh, weapon of mass destruction. Uh, social media. <laughs> <laughs> you can Twitter. use it anyhow. Is that negatively or positively? So a lot you can add by even social media through the use of social media. So I do not believe that you need an office. Also, but somebody who is a governor today cannot tomorrow decide to go and be a local government chairman in his community just for him to be able to add more value to his own immediate community. But yeah, if you find somebody who is a former governor saying, look, I'm going to be counselor, say, ah, certainly. By the way, you have a problem. That is a problem. So that means... The way we see it in our own community is that there is a disconnect somewhere. Yes, sir. Well, and that should not be so. I've been in a country, I've seen a country before outside this uh, territory where somebody who was, even their uh, minister, came back to be council chairman. I was serving his uh, community, immediate community, excitedly. Whereas here, yeah, this can never happen. I said, no, it can't be now. Uh, why will you imagine me as chairman to go and become counselor? And they will, now, no, they will now put a proverb. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that's God one God. aspect of it. Yeah, the last aspect of your question related to the yeah, uh, when, law, legal practice in Nigeria, I must tell you to a large extent, uh, I don't want to use the word lucrative, it's, uh, it's comfortable. Yeah, because we hear the big amounts they pay you. Somebody is a counsel to this person, 500 million. It's a matter of choice. In uh, you can go for a lesser one. There are always lesser lawyers. We want that. Are cheaper lawyers are there. <laughs> the other ones are there. It's a matter of choice. But the one thing I know is that there is a presumption in favor of anybody that is a lawyer that at least it will be comfortable. Okay. Mm, so do they actually pay them those huge amounts or is there, uh, is there suspicion of money laundering? Because you hear a lawyer earned huge amounts of money. Do, do they actually earn that much? They earn that much. Really? Yes, yes. They do. They do. Ah, and you I know, told it's parents, the only learned profession. I told my parents I wanted to be a lawyer. <laughs> I told them, Dr. B, I'm not lying. They said that uh, there are no job for lawyers anymore. That I should follow them to catch a high court tomorrow. I come and say how many lawyers are doing. <laughs> Affidavit. 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 <laughs> Now, I'll go anyway. No, it's never too late. It's never too you late. You can go back. I'm 37. You're a commissioner at 32. I'm saying, well, I don't know. Uh, what are you saying? Eh? No, it's good. Anyway, uh, Dr. Moise Barre, I, I, have, I have to let you go because uh, uh, you have so much to do. I can always bring you back. You're always there for me. Uh, this is one of the people that God has blessed me with. And I'd like you to stand up and give him a, a rousing round of applause. Thank yeah. you very much for all you do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. B. Because the Teju Baby Face Show will be back.
after these messages.